Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, we're talking about nuclear energy and Fukushima one year later. That's up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with me, Dr. Kiki, episode number 136, recorded Thursday, March 15th, 2012. A nuclear conversation. This episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by Netflix. Watch thousands of TV episodes and movies on your PC, Mac, iPad, iPhone, or TV instantly. All streamed directly to you, saving you time, money, and hassle. For your free 30-day trial, go to netflix.com slash twit. Welcome to Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, everyone. I am Dr. Kiki, and this is the hour-long show that you get to sit back, relax, listen watch, enjoy the world of science. And as usual, we have one hour with one expert in an area of the sciences. Today, we are going to be going back a year and taking a look back at Fukushima. Uh, It's been a year since the Fukushima nuclear disaster, and it's time to take a look at what what we've learned since then and what nuclear power looks like going forward. So our guest today is Eliza Strickland, and she is joining us from IEEE Spectrum. But first... We have a few science headlines, right? It's March 15th, 2012, the Ides of March, so you better better beware. And this is the science that made headlines this week. Up first, the fossilized remains of at least four individuals were found in in caves in Guangxi province in China that date to between 14,300 and 11,500 years old. The skulls are structurally different from modern humans and along with other archaic features suggest that this is a new species of human who existed side by side with Neanderthals and Stone Age Homo sapiens. The description of the people who are being called the Red Deer Cave people can be found in PLOS One. The sharpest teeth in the history of the planet belonged to a 500 million year old Precambrian jawless animal called a conodont. According to a study in the Proceedings of the, Nash- of the Royal Society B that used a technique called finite element analysis, the species known as Wormiella excavata had razor sharp teeth with tips just two microns in width that were used for slicing and crushing. Sounds like a lot of fun. A tiny feathered raptor fossil, aptly named Microraptor, got a shiny new look this week. Reporting in Science, an international team of scientists deduced that the avian relative's plumage was iridescent and black based on analysis of narrow stacked melanocortins preserved in the feathers. The ancient dinosaur likely used its fancy tail feathers for wooing mates. There's a reason your cat is not interested in your dessert. They don't have the taste receptor to sense sweet flavors. A study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences expands our understanding of the sense of taste across species this week by analyzing sweet taste receptor genes in 12 related mammalian species. It seems dietary specialization leads to loss of the ability to taste sweets. Eat too much meat? You don't need them necessarily. A study in the journal Psychological Science concludes that military training has lasting effects on people's personalities. Comparing 241 soldiers to 628 civilians, the research found that the only difference was in agreeableness, with soldiers experiencing less of an increase in the personality trait during the study period. A study involving Canadian police officers found that a mere 60 seconds of physical exertion can impair memory. While the officers in the study were aware of possible threats during an experimental simulation, their ability to process that information and remember it after the fact deteriorated with exertion. So maybe don't work out before you're 
going to go take a test. Might not be a good idea. Scientists working with DARPA turned a snail into a living battery. Publishing in the Journal of the American Chemical Society, the team implanted carbon nanotube-based electrodes into the snail, which were able to create and conduct electricity derived from glucose and oxygen in the snail's hemolymph. That's snail blood. The researchers are looking to boost the currently low amount of electricity for future applications involving free-ranging snails wearing microsensors or cameras. The future is here, and it is filled with cyborg snail spies. A study in Nature Climate Change and used mathematical models to determine that Greenland's ice sheet is doomed to melt. Yes, that's right. The ice will be gone someday. The warmer things get, the faster it's going to melt. Within 50,000 years on the outside to under 2,000 years on the inside, Greenland's ice sheet contains enough water to raise global sea levels by 20 feet if all melts. Researchers at Fermi Lab received a short message in a cavern 100 meters underground where many modern communica- communication technologies fail. The message spelled out neutrino and was sent through 240 meters of stone using neutrinos translated into binary. And while it's still a long way off from being practical, the proof of concept experiment suggests that we might someday be using neutrinos to communicate with people on the opposite side of the planet or on the far side of the moon. And speaking of the moon, any lunar landing conspiracy theorists in the audience can now go back to your caves. NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter has released the best image yet of Apollo 11's landing site. Visible in the image are the first footfalls on the powdery lunar surface taken by Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin. Um, and the passive seismic experiment package and a device called the Laser Ranging Retro Reflector, which still collects data today. And to round it all up, a new species of leopard frog was found in New York City using molecular DNA analysis. Honeybees have different personalities, or since they're insects, maybe we should say insectalities, with some bees being more likely to take to the skies in search of adventure than others. And the brain fog associated with menopause has been confirmed as real by science. Yes, ladies, many of you will experience poor memory as you go through the change. And that does it for the science headline news this week. Let me know what you think about these science news stories or tell me what you think uh, should be news by emailing me, drkiki at drkiki.tv or you can leave me a voicemail, 650-741-5454. Now it's time for a word from our sponsor. I'd like to thank Netflix for sponsoring this episode of Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netflix streams thousands of TV episodes and movies directly to you instantly, saving you time, money, and hassle. There are several easy ways that you can instantly access Netflix streaming movies and TV shows. Among those ways, you can uh, access it using your Mac, iPad, iPhone, PC, and even some Android devices. There are apps for the mobile devices that make it easy. You can watch on your uh, on your gaming console if you if you've got an Xbox 360, a PS3, or a Nintendo Wii. You can just watch it right on your TV through one of those devices. If you're not a gamer but you have one of the set top boxes like a Roku box. Boxy Box, or even an Apple TV, you can use one of those inexpensive devices that are really easy to use to access Netflix and get instant movies and shows. And you can start watching whatever show or movie you're interested in on any of these devices. Stop it at any, any point in time if you get you know, woken, if you, if, you, if you get disturbed by a crying child, you can stop it. Go see what's going on, what, they're, what your kids are fighting about. And maybe you have to have to pick up your iPhone and and take a bus after that. You can't sit and watch the television at home. Easy to do. Just pick up your iPhone and you can start exactly where you left off at uh, using one of their one of their seamless infrastructure apps. Whatever each way you choose to access Netflix, the great thing is is that you can watch as many movies and TV shows any way you want and you can cancel at any time for absolutely free. And Netflix is giving you an offer. You can try Netflix free for 30 days. All you have to do is go to their URL, netflix.com slash twit. That's right. Use this URL, netflix.com slash twit, and you can sign up for your free 30-day trial right now. 
netflix.com slash twit. We thank Netflix for their support, and we hope that you enjoy watching instantly with Netflix. And now, let's get on with our show. We'd love to uh, introduce my guest today. Eliza Strickland is an associate editor at the technology magazine IEEE Spectrum on the Asia Beat, and she previously worked at Discover.com as an online news editor, where she created the 80 Beats Science News blog, which I frequently frequently read. It's a very good blog still. And as a freelance writer for Wired, Salon.com, and Mother Jones, she's been covering the ongoing story of the Fukushima nuclear disaster for IEE, IEEE Spectrum for the past year. So without further ado, Eliza, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, I think you're muted. Oh, I don't you're think back. so. There we are. Now you're back. All right. Good. Good, good. <laughs> Let's, for a moment, I didn't hear you, but it's great to have, it's great to have you here. Um, how did you get put on the, the Fukushima story and how did you get, uh, get involved in this in the first place? Well, it was a uh, pretty dramatic timing. Um, so I started work here at IEEE Spectrum uh, on March 9th of last year. And um, they told me, the next day on March 10th, they told me that I'd be the Asia editor, uh, you know, trying to keep, a, keep an eye on uh, all the technology stories throughout Asia. Um, Which can be a lot. Yeah, it's a rather broad mandate. Uh, and then the very next day, March 11th, uh, I came in to work and found you know, the news of the tsunami, the earthquake tsunami, uh, in Japan waiting for me. Um, so we sort of t collectively as a team here jumped on the story and started covering the technology aspects, um, everything from, um, you know, buoys across the Pacific that measure uh, the tsunami levels, um, you know, the, the systems in Japan, the automated systems that uh, allow um, you know, electricity to stop going through buildings to, um, to sort of shut down the trains automatically. Uh, we were sort of on top of all that. And then in the middle of the day, it started to become clear that you know there was a real serious problem at Fukushima uh, Daiichi, the nuclear power plant. Um, and then it was basically just an obsessive task for the next oh I don't know you know eight months or so, just sort of not not only, not only the first few days chronicling the you know the immediate disaster, but then trying to make sense of it, um, trying to figure out what had actually happened. Uh, because in those first few days, it was actually really unclear. The the news coming out of the out of the Japanese government was terrible. Um, the plant's owner was basically not releasing information. Uh, so people were kind of just guessing at what was happening. Um, and so we spent maybe the next six months or so just trying to unravel the story of what really had happened there at the plant. Yeah, and we, we, as I was following the story through various news sources, it was really clear that a lot of people were not giving up information in the beginning, and there were there were a lot of tight lips. So was it just really really hard to try and piece everything together? Yeah, it was it was really a, quite a challenge. Um, um, we now know that the Japanese government you know, was fully aware that these um, these reactors at Fukushima Daiichi were melting down. Um, they didn't admit that for maybe about five months that there had actually been meltdowns. They kept saying, well, there were some problems. Maybe some of the fuel is slightly damaged. But they didn't admit that there were three meltdowns for something like five months, which is, um, which is pretty, pretty disgraceful in my opinion. Um, TEPCO, the, the owner of the plant, uh, eventually um, started putting out information um, but in a pretty technical ways, so that it was it was it was quite a challenge to piece it together into a real narrative of um, of the chain of events, the chain of disasters in those first um, those first few days that led to you know the worst nuclear disaster since Chernobyl. I think there are a lot of parallels um, with the Fukushima disaster and the Gulf War, uh, not Gulf War, the Gulf oil crisis, mm -hmm. where we have these corporations who are in charge of. Um, uh, in, uh, aspects of industry that have had far-reaching environmental consequences and that, you know, uh, there's the technology uh, that they're using that you can talk about, but you don't really know exactly what happened until much later and then the consequences even further down the line. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is, you know, jumping ahead to, you know, now present day, um, but it has absolutely backfired for them. Um, the Japanese public is uh, is terrified and furious, you know, as you know, as they have uh, some right to be. 
Um, and it seems quite likely that Japan will eventually, you know, not, not in the very short term, but will eventually uh, turn away entirely from nuclear power. So those power companies have just completely destroyed their, you know, their core business um, just because they didn't want to uh, let the public in and let the public know what was really happening. I think that's, that's I think, a, a major point is that the, the public, uh, because this, the power generation does serve the public, and so the public's opinions really influence where where power comes from and, and where they want to buy their power from and it, there's the, the, that they thought that being closed lipped and not telling everything and not being transparent would get them anywhere positive <laughs> you know it just it just goes goes a long way i think for you know trying to you know, corporate openness to it you know <laughs> as much as possible especially when you're dealing with the public it could be more beneficial but Mm-hmm. A year later, you ha- the coverage that you've done for uh, IEEE Spectrum um, is now up for a National Magazine Award, which is just fantastic. Congratulations on that! Oh, thank you. Good luck. I hope that uh, I hope that <laughs> I hope that you win. Um, Thanks. We'll find out next Tuesday or next yeah next Tuesday I think. Oh great! <laughs> I hope that we hear good news. Um, so tell us about the different the the how, how did you go about starting to look into this disaster and tell the story? Um, I, so I did go to Japan in uh, July. Uh, I'd done you know, a great deal of, of interviewing before then. Um, you know, I'd spoken with um, uh, some officials at the, the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, people who had gone over there to Japan in the first 24 hours of the accident. Um, and so they'd sort of walked me through some of the, um, you know, some of the details of what we knew. Um, when I went to Japan, um, I got just by by virtue of you know begging and pleading and insisting and fighting. I got a one hour interview with TEPCO, um, <laughs> and that was you know bringing all the the resources of the IEEE to bear um, to get this one hour. Um, it was it was actually a remarkable scene though because um, you know, at that point at that point maybe there are about twenty nuclear reactors operating. Um, out of the original 54, because um, Japan uh, gradually, um, as, as the plants went offline for temporary maintenance, they just kept them offline um, mm-hmm. until they could you know, be, be assured that they were actually safe. So all throughout this past year, they've been gradually losing you know, operating reactors. Uh, but when I was there in July, I think it was about 20 operating, something like that. Um, and so the whole country was uh, involved in a really serious energy conservation effort. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, so at TEPCO, uh, it was the most bizarre um, interview I've ever had because the there's an enormous, you know, very glossy corporate headquarters that was pitch dark inside. The Carters were pitch dark. Uh, one elevator was working and the air conditioning was turned off. So it was this hot, dark, sweaty place. And people were scuttling around in the dark. These men in business suits were sort of scuttling around. <laughs> <laughs> it just felt like you know, apocalyptic. You know? Oh, weird. <laughs> yeah, that, that's you know, that's kind of a side note. So, but I, you know, I talked with them for about an hour, and uh, you know, basically sort of like butted my head against the wall that they were presenting. Um, really, most of the information I ended up getting from the documents that they did release, um, you know, they they put out documents to the Japanese government, um, and. Uh, and those, if you you know, if you go through the hundreds and hundreds of pages of documents, you you gradually, uh, you know, you can sort of pick out the narrative elements and and finally make sense of it all. Uh, so that's what we tried to do for the article. Um, I also, you know, I met with other academics over there and nuclear regulators. Um, and one of the most um, fascinating uh, interviews I had, which uh, actually didn't even make it into the article, um, I went up to meet with. Uh, one of the mayors of a town that got evacuated. Um, it's the mayor of the town of uh, Okuma, which was about two kilometers from the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Um, his town you know, was full of people who worked at the plant. Uh, they absolutely believed in its safety. They had grown up in the shadow of this thing and they saw it, you know, they saw TEPCO as a benefactor and a protector. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and he, he, you know, when I met him, he was, you know, in exile. The whole town was in exile. Um, and I met him at their sort of temporary uh, town hall, which was in, a, in a, an unused school building 
uh, in another city. Um, and the, this, this, this school building was full of paper cranes that people all around the world had sent to this town uh, in sympathy. Um, and he told me that they, when they left, you know, people would just, just took like a t-shirt and toothbrush because they thought they'd be back five hours. Um, they had no, no conception that things could go this wrong. They thought the plant just absolutely had to be safe. TEPCO must have layer after layer after layer of protection there to ensure that nothing this bad could happen. Yeah. Um, and instead, you know, those people, you know, have, they've only been allowed to go back, um, you know, to collect cherished belongings, but um, they'll never live there again. It's, it's, it's quite clear at this point. What kind of a, a radius? Um, you know, we know that there was, there, after Chernobyl, there was this large area that was the deemed off limits, and it has been off limits. And there have been interesting studies of wildlife returning to the area, and people have been trying to figure out how the radiation has affected um, just nature and the environment, um, let alone the people who were there during the accident. But what kind of, what are we seeing in Japan now? What have they done as a result? Mm -hmm. So they eventually established a 30 kilometer uh, voluntary evacuation zone and within uh, that's the sort of 30 kilometer radius around the plant. And within that, there was a a 20 kilometer mandatory evacuation zone. Um, And then there was sort of an additional area to the northwest of the plant where they realized that the wind had swept a lot of the uh, radiation Hmm. uh, in the days after the um, after the accident. Now, as to what the levels of radiation are, it seems to be um, remarkably varied. In in a single town, you can have um, some areas that seem just about safe and others that are just atrocious. Um, So the worst worst, uh, reading measurement I've heard in the surrounding towns was in a town called uh, Futaba, which is also uh, directly adjacent to the Fukushima Daiichi plant. It's another one where you know everybody at, in the town worked there, um, and they found levels of radiation there. It would um, it would be the equivalent of a, a a dose, a yearly dose of 470 millisieverts uh, for one year. Um, and to put that in context, um, uh, a worker at a nuclear plant is um, has an annual limit of 50 millisieverts per year. Um, that's the safety, the top safety threshold. And in, in an emergency situation, the um, they're allowed to, to push that up to 100 millisieverts per year. Wow. But you can still see um, that you know some parts of these of these towns are just you know completely poisoned. Um, but with that said, uh, there's also parts that are not, uh, and there's towns that are further away from the plant that. Um, that have levels maybe in the like you know twenty to a hundred millisieverts range, and uh, it's just not clear uh, if areas like that would really have uh, detrimental health effects. Right. Um, you know the science on this is still you know being fought over, um, and then to add to that, we have this sort of impossibly complex problem in that um, the government basically flat out lied to its own people yeah. following the disaster. And now if they try and tell people, you can come back, it's safe, you know, who's going to believe them? Um, so we have, the, you know, we have this sort of problem of the government's own making that they've, uh, you know, no one trusts the government and you know, therefore they might ha- end up abandoning far more land and far more towns than might actually be necessary. Hmm. Um, yeah, so, there, so pe- people might just, just not come back to areas that actually are safe. Yeah, 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 and the scale of the cleanup that the government is talking about to reassure people is is uh, it just sounds impossibly daunting. Uh, they want to basically like scrape the fop, the top five centimeters of of soil off this entire area. You know, a radius of you know thirty kilometers around Fukushima. I think uh, if I'm remembering correctly, it's an area that's uh, about equivalent to the size of Luxembourg. The city state. Um, so you think about scraping off the entire, you know, the, the topsoil off the entire area, and then you have to figure out where to put it and where to store it. Um, it's, you know, the, the cleanup, the, the scale of the cleanup that they're talking about um, seems uh, daunting, if not impossible. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm very curious to see you know, how that does play out over the next, you know, few years. Yeah. Well, you know, they can they can just take that dirt and put it under a mountain in Nevada, 
I'm sure that's fine. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure no one will mind that. <laughs> no one will mind. Yeah, it, it, looking at there was a there was a map that was up on the screen for a while of the the area, and we think about you know it's uh it, the the area is not just land. There's also water that's been affected. And during the disaster, there was a lot of talk about uh, the the cooling chambers Mm -hmm. and how they were allowing water in um, from outside and that the tidal water was coming in and going out. And so do you know anything about, um, you know, how how the radiation, how much radiation is expected to have gotten out into into the the waters? Um, Mm -hmm. And because it's, you know, ocean, is it just going to get uh, diluted? Mm-hmm. Yeah, a fair bit did um, did spill out in the first um, first few weeks, really. Yeah. Uh, they've since tried, TEPCO has tried to put a stop to that. Um, whenever they found a leak of, you know, basically radioactive water rushing into the ocean, they would plug it up. And they've, they're now working on basically a subterranean wall, um, a, a, a wall that just plunges down into the ground to ensure that water can't leak from the plant into the ocean. Um, so they're, they're trying to cope with that. Um, as for what was already released, um, uh, there have been a few studies done, uh, and it seems like there aren't, uh, there aren't immediate concerns. Uh, it was it was um, you know, diluted enough that uh, there wasn't an immediate danger. Um, that said, there, there ha- are still studies that have to be done about um, some species of fish that can, you know, you know if they're on the sort of top of the food, food chain, they devour other smaller fish that have trace elements of you know, trace radioactivity in them, if that will accumulate in these predator fish. Um, so I know people are still working on that, um, taking cruises out around in their protective gear to you know, try and find out exactly um, exactly what the long-term consequences of this are going to be. Yeah, I think that's going to be really interesting to see. And I know uh, people here on the California coast um, have been concerned about uh, radiation coming over in the air, radiation possibly making its way over through the water, or, you know, since we're sharing international waters, you know, how is that going to affect uh, fishing and, uh, and food? So mm-hmm. there, there are a lot of questions that are, don't just have local uh, Japanese consequences, but actually have much more global implications. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And with um, farmers too. I mean, we live, yeah, we live in a globalized world. So, uh, you know, some of the beef that you know, was being shipped around the world was coming from some affected areas. Uh, some, some beef was found to be, uh, immediately after the accident, was found to be contaminated. So they had to shut down all exports. Um, I think a lot of countries are still um, refusing shipments. Just don't want to take the risk, even though, uh, even though it's just a very limited area that would actually be of concern. Um, same with um, same with some vegetables. Uh, rice rice in the Fukushima prefecture was found to be contaminated, which was of deep concern to you know, Japanese people. It's you yeah. know, it's a staple crop. Um, and then you don't even think about it, but uh, you know there's um, a lot of factories that were shut down. Um, both because of the earthquake and the tsunami and then because of the uh, nuclear disaster. Um, so uh, some, some firms rebuilt, some, some rebuilt, but they're kind of hedging their bets. They're uh, setting up backup factories in Taiwan or places that um, they think might be uh, safer in the long run. So, yeah, this has had um, you know, huge effects on, on both Japan and, and on the world, obviously. It's, it's, uh, it was, uh, it's just amazing when you think... Uh, you know, these small little nuclear cores uh, in these three reactors, and all of a sudden the whole world is you know, shaking. Yeah, exactly. What What's going on at the the nuclear plants right now in terms of there? I know there have been rumors that there's still, you know, there's still meltdown occurring. I mean, mm-hmm. what's, what's actually happening? Yeah, so the, um, the owners, TEPCO, did manage to bring the plant to what they call cold shutdown, um, which basically means that it's stable enough that they can think about what to do next. Uh, it means they're not in this sort of ongoing day-to-day crisis uh, mode. And mm-hmm. they only reached that cold shutdown uh, around December of last year. Um, so uh, cold shutdown means that the fuel is being kept cool enough um, that it's not 
uh, boiling away their water on top of it, the water that keeps it cool. Um, and so because the water, because it's being kept covered with water, uh, radioactive elements can't just, uh, you know, can't be escaping. Uh, there's not a, a immediate danger of more contamination. Um, but yeah, now, now the next enormously complicated phase of the project of decommissioning the plant begins. Um, TEPCO has said it's going to take about 40 years to fully decommission the plant. Um, um, one interesting thing, you know, originally there was some, um, some discussion of whether it would just have to be entombed like Chernobyl. You know, Chernobyl, uh, the reactors are still sitting there. They're just covered in concrete. Um, uh, this one, TEPCO has decided that they're going, they, they, at least they're planning to remove every, you know, brick and piece of rubble and uh, eventually leave it, um, you know, sort of a grassy, unscarred plain. Um, that nobody can go to. <laughs> <Ever>. <laughs> you can look at it through binoculars from a distance. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it'll be very lovely from a watchtower 20 miles away. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so this process of decommissioning is, is, is incredibly daunting. Um, you know, at the moment, because the nuclear fuel melted down through the bottom of three reactors, they don't know exactly where it is. There, there, there aren't any, you know, there are very few um, kind of equipment, uh, you know, monitoring equipments that can withstand radiation of that, of that degree. So they, the first thing they need to do is just uh, figure out exactly where the fuel is. Um, the next step after that uh, will be to, um, to flood the reactors all the way up to the top, which is uh, sort of something you usually uh, do when you open up a reactor. Um, like if you're going to change the fuel, if you're going to reload fuel for a new, you know, a new couple of years, um, it's the same procedure. So they'll have to flood the reactors all the way up to the top, which means that the reactor vessels can't be leaking anymore. They have to fix that. Um, then they flood the reactors. Then they, um, then they're going to need to get the melted fuel out of there. So really, the, the best way, or the way they did that in Three Mile Island, was uh, they lowered drills down into the reactor vessels. Uh, broke up the melted fuel, well, you know, the, the um, blobs of fuel, um, and then sucked it up into vacuum, you know, with vacuums into uh, safe containment vessels. Um, so this is, you know, it's, these are big reactor vessels. This is really dangerous material. Um, the whole process is, you know, it's going to take, uh, you know, decades. Um and then once you have the nuclear fuel, and then you have to figure out what to do with it, and you know that's a whole next step. Uh, right? Yeah. What do you do? You take it to another nuclear facility to to use? Can you can you can continue using the fuel? The fuel is still viable to some yeah, degree. It's the, the one the stuff from Fukushima Daiichi really isn't because it's okay. gotten mixed up with all these other metals in the in the meltdown process. Um, so it's really it's it's a loss. Um, hmm. But it, this definitely does, you know, once again highlight the um, the enormous unsolved problem of nuclear power, which is that we don't know what to do with the waste. Um, Put it under we... a mountain in Nevada. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> that hasn't worked out yet for anyone, by the way. <laughs> yeah, you know, a couple other countries have uh, started um, permanent, uh, what they call permanent geological repositories. Yeah. Uh, uh, but... The crucial thing was they were done with the involvement and with the consent of the people in the surrounding areas. Um, Yucca Mountain was pretty much forced on Nevada, mm -hmm. and Nevada is really not happy about it. Um, so I think, um, yeah, I think it's you know it's still possible that we might be able to, um, you know, pull off these kind of permanent repositories. But it's it's clear they have to be done in, in a sort of much more uh, sort of collaborative, open way. Um, right. Otherwise, you're just uh, opening up a giant can of radioactive worms. <laughs> and those are no fun for anybody. <laughs> um, you, made the, you made the comment for the, the, the cleanup that, the, that equipment actually can't withstand the high levels of, of radiation. And that's something where with, um, with the Gulf oil spill, we could send robots in or we could send you know, different... Uh, different devices that people were so innovative to create and, you know, oh, this will clean up the oil. But that that doesn't necessarily work the same way. We can't just, I mean, we can send a robot in, but they won't, a robot won't even last that long and a human lasts, lasts that much less. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, they had the that was really fascinating actually because uh, everyone thinks of Japan as being just full of robots, you know, robots right. everywhere. Right. <laughs> robots and can do can, everything in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> they can dance, they can like, you know, help out your grandma. Um, but it turns out they just didn't have uh, robots that were ready to withstand this kind of radiation. So they call them like, basically it's, you know, it's the electronics, you need radiation hardened electronics. Um, so after the, after the accident, finally they started um, getting some in, as I think you're showing their, uh, the iRobot PackBot. Um, they eventually started uh, sending in some specialized uh, bots that could um, that could stand up to the extreme uh, the extreme radiation, um, and then that started to be useful because then they started uh, to be able to take video in parts of the plants that humans couldn't get to. Yeah, um, they could you know, sort of go exploring uh, mm-hmm. vicariously. And this video you're showing is uh, it's fascinating. One of uh, one of my colleagues here, uh, Erica Guizzo, he's our robotics editor. And he found this blog uh, on a, a Japanese a website. It was a it was a, a, a guy, a contractor who was working at at this Fukushima Daiichi cleanup, and he happened to be a robotics operator. And he started blogging his experience and posting videos. Oh, neat. Um, it was all in Japanese, so Eriko didn't know exactly what it was, but he you know he figured out enough to know it was pretty interesting and a real insider look. Uh, and he basically scrapes the whole thing, scrapes the whole thing from the website, which was a good thing because the next day it was gone. Tepco got word of it and shut it down. Um, you know, they just don't, they don't like people knowing what's going on. They don't like letting people inside, um, even just to see, a, you know, what seems like a pretty harmless video of a robot rolling around. Right. Um, but uh, yeah, I thought it was a pretty fascinating little uh little moment. Um, yeah, you get to see the, the guys training the robots. They have some fun with them. They like ride around on them occasionally. <laughs> <laughs> if I, if I had a, if I had a radiation withstanding robot, I would, I'd ride around on it too. Take it for a spin. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly. So, so we've got, we've got cleanup happening. We've got uh, some amount of containment, um, mm-hmm. where they're, they're actually able to to work on it and try and me, uh, mediate the damage just a, a little bit better than they could in the in the short time right after the disaster. Um, what what else is going on? What's happening within um, you know the I guess the the Japanese public and how is this mm. affecting the people? Yeah, it's it's very interesting to watch. Um, there's a recent poll uh, that asked um, the Japanese public. What they wanted to do about nuclear power, and 66% said that it should be phased out completely uh, over time. Um, so you have a clear majority of people saying that they do not want to uh, rely on nuclear power. Um, nobody, or almost nobody, is saying shut down everything now. Mm-hmm. Um, it would just uh, it would be a real blow to the economy. Um, so the challenge then is how do you convince the public that these uh, that all the that other plants are safe enough to reopen and won't cause you know their little girls to have to get uh, radiation scanned? It's a heartbreaking photo. Yeah. Um, so right now, uh, currently as we speak, there's only two nuclear reactors operating out of uh, the original 54. Um, those two will probably go offline before the summer. Um, now, summer is usually when Japan uses most electricity. It gets pretty hot there. Yeah. Um, so there'll once again be a, an extreme energy conservation effort. Um, you know, what's interesting is that you know some people say, like, uh, I mean, if you go to Tokyo, the bright lights are still lit. It looks, you know, it looks like you know it's it's uh, it's a bright shiny place. Um, you know, every toilet in town can like sing a song to you like clearly they're like <laughs> they're right. using electricity <laughs> they're using plenty of electricity so that causes some people to say well what's what's the problem like why why do we if we're getting along with only two nuclear reactors why do we even need to bring any back online um but they're doing this by they're keeping the lights on by importing oil and gas you know that's um yeah. obviously that's totally screwing up their their greenhouse gas targets um, it also means that the country is less energy independent, which, you know, nobody is, is really that excited about. Um, and then there's also, I mean, there's a human toll. 
a lot of companies have had workers, um, you know, on very odd schedules to to sort of spread out the the energy usage. Mm. Uh, so I know some engineers and and you know technologists who work on um, really in energy intensive projects, you know, like supercomputing uh, kind of stuff. And sometimes they have to work at night. They're working on the weekends. Um, they're working every other day. Uh, so. You know, Japan, Japanese life has not exactly, you know, gone back to normal. Um, and it's a real question of of what can be done uh, to meet their long-term energy needs. Yeah, especially with yeah. public opinion, as you said, not mm-hmm. not uh, wanting to continue to use use mm-hmm. nuclear. But there, mm-hmm. uh, there are other energy sources. Japan is known for being a very seismically active area. And so uh, um, uh, hydrothermal. Uh, mm-hmm. geochemical or yeah. um, just geothermal uh, energy probably are all big sources that they could could look at yeah. more yeah I'd love to see uh, I'd love to see them really um, try and make good use of the geothermal energy that they're sitting on top of literally uh, the problem at the moment is that uh, most of the the most the easiest the most of the places where it's easiest to access that geothermal energy are in national parks mm. uh, so they're going to have to uh, really uh, work their way through that sort of regulatory tangle. Um, there's a lot of interest now in uh, solar and wind. Um, the the problems mostly have been that uh, well, there's a couple of problems. You know, Japanese uh, topography is not ideally suited for uh, for solar and wind. It's it's you know it's very it's a small country. It's densely populated. Uh, it's it's hilly. Yeah. Um, so it's going to be you know, slightly challenging to find the right spots to put in big installations that would actually you know, provide enough power. Mm-hmm. Um, but more than that, it's, it's, it's political, it's business, it's regulatory. Um, the Japanese energy sector has been dominated by these uh, near monopolies, basically regional monopolies like TEPCO. Um, I think it's nine of these companies that basically divvied up the country and had their fiefdom. Um, and they control the generation of energy, they control the transmission, and the distribution. So if you're a small like solar startup and you want to send some energy around, you have to make a deal with TEPCO or whatever the monopoly is in your area just to make use of their transmission lines. Right. Uh, and those terms can be very onerous um, and it's, it's made things really difficult. Uh, so now that uh, you know, now the situation being what it is, the government finally has an incentive to try and uh, to try and encourage renewable energy um, there's a lot of talk about deregulating the energy industry and taking some of the power away from these monopolies. Um, it seems like it has to happen. Uh, it's, it, or, you know, certainly something has to change. Um, the, 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 the system as it's set up does not encourage renewables. They really need to work on that. Yeah, that's a systemic problem, though. Um, as far as nuclear power and its safety and taking a a global a step back and taking a global look at nuclear production of power um where where are we right now um Mm -hmm. united states germany what's what's going on um so compare it to japan where people are like no more we're done with that (laughs) (laughs) what's happening everywhere else yeah um Basically, every country in the world that had a nuclear power program or even hopes of a nuclear power program took a real serious look at it after Fukushima. Um, some of the most dramatic examples were in Europe, uh, particularly Germany, which pledged to shut down its entire nuclear reactor program by 2022, I think is the year. Um, so that's huge. Uh, nuclear power provides about 30% of their energy. They're going to have to uh, ramp up renewables. Um, a few other countries in Europe also, Switzerland, I think, uh, has pledged to, to shut down its, its reactors. Um, some that we're talking about building, like Italy, have now said they won't. Um, so Europe is sort of leading, is sort of on Japan's side in turning away from nuclear uh, based on safety concerns. Hmm. Um, uh, as you can see from our, from our map there, China is building like crazy. China is the biggest, the other big story in in nuclear energy these days. Um, They've got 14 already, 14 reactors operating now. They had 26 under construction when Fukushima happened. And they had plans to have a total of 100 built by by 2020, or no, by 2030. 
and more and more beyond that, they are just they're just going gangbusters uh, in large part because they're trying to get their economy off coal. Um, and after Fukushima, they the government declared the Chinese government declared a moratorium on uh, approvals for new nuclear reactors. So the, the ones that were in construction could continue, but they stopped all progress on everything everything new. Hmm. Um, and that sort of stalemate lasted for about a year. Um, it was only about uh, maybe two weeks ago that the Chinese government declared that they would uh, start approving new projects again, start uh, constructing new projects. Um, it's not clear exactly um, what they've done to reassure themselves. I, I believe they'll be coming out with uh, new safety guidelines, a sort of new energy policy. Mm. Um, but we're sort of waiting to see that, uh, see when that comes out. Um, I think it is quite likely that um, they'll shift more towards uh, some safer, more modern uh, reactor designs. Uh, they've been they've been planning to go with a sort of workhorse um, pressurized water reactor. And just build those, you know, like gangbusters all over the country. I think uh, Fukushima is a strong incentive to uh, jump to the next generation technology. Um, in the U.S., um, there's almost nothing happening. We've got, I think, uh, just like four reactors that are likely to be built uh, anytime soon. Um, a couple in Georgia, a couple in North Carolina. Uh, but honestly, that has more to do with economics than safety. Mm -hmm. um, the price of natural gas is so low right now that it just makes a lot more sense to build a natural gas plant than it does to build a nuclear plant. Because um, so, they're really expensive to build. It's not an easy mm -hmm. an easy project to get started. Yeah, yeah, it requires, you know, even even with these federal loan guarantees that the U.S. offers, it's, uh, it's a massively expensive undertaking. And it seems like more often than not, construction goes uh, wildly over budget and yeah. takes way longer than anyone expected. So, you know, the known, the easier known quantities of building a natural gas plant right now are uh, sort of uh, weighing heavily on the minds of uh, energy companies. In terms of um, other technologies, we've got, you know, you, taught, you, you mentioned next generation plants and a lot of the plants here in the United States that are currently um, active are, you know, 50 years old. They're aging reactors. They're, you know, they're old technology and it just wouldn't it make sense just to iterate up to the next the next um, pebble bed reactors, things that are less likely to melt down. Um, and then I hear that China is also looking into uh, the lifter, the liquid fluoride thorium reactors. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, the aging reactor fleet is a serious concern. Um, I had one guy say, uh, the question is actually, is there life after 60? Uh, would it be possible to take these reactors? Uh, you know, right now they're getting life extensions, uh, license extensions from 40 years to 60 years. Mm -hmm. um, but but there's already talk in the nuclear industry about extending that further on to 80 years. Um, and that's basically an economics question. Um, that's that's the motivation. I mean, these plants uh, have already basically been paid off. So, so if you can add on another 20 years of life, you're pretty much just uh, adding on uh, profits. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not saying that it's necessarily a, a bad thing. I mean, if they... If they can be shown to be safe, then you don't want to um, throw away a sound investment and a you know a reliable source of um, non-carbon emitting you know energy. Um, but there are a lot of questions to be answered about whether these um, you know exactly how these reactors age because we just don't know. We've never had reactors that are eighty years old. You know? Yeah. So you need to figure out you know what happens to the concrete that when it's that old when it's being been bombarded with radiation for eight for you know 60 years um what happens to steel containment vessels um because a lot of the smaller parts you can replace easily enough um but these big uh, enormous structures these sort of containment structures are basically impossible to replace um or at least we've we've never done it uh and no one's really talking about doing it so then the question is just can they withstand another you know, 20 years of of uh of bombardment by you know, radiation. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah, the new designs I think are really exciting. Um, Pebble bed is, is totally, totally cool. Um, I actually uh, visited a, uh, a very small pilot scale uh, pebble bed reactor in China um, hmm. 
not too far from Beijing uh, when I was there last summer. And they're, um, they're working on, um, on building the first commercial scale pillow bed reactor in China. Um, that was actually one of the projects that was about to start construction when Fukushima happened. And then the Chinese government imposed this moratorium. So it's still, uh, it's still waiting to break ground. Um, but now that things are starting up again, it looks likely to proceed. Um, yeah, I do think, um, I do think it, it would be pretty wise to, uh, to start, uh, to start investing in these, uh, safer reactors. Uh, you know, if, if governments make the decision to, to keep with nuclear at all, then, um, it seems like you just, it's just a no brainer to pick the safest technology. Um, the issue with pillow bed is that, uh, you don't get quite as much, uh, bang for your buck. You don't get quite as much power per dollar. Um, uh, so you have to really prioritize safety in order to build a pillow bed. Um, but in my mind, I mean, what else is worth prioritizing <laughs> in this world? <laughs> exactly. You, you can prioritize safety and maybe not have disasters like Fu- Fukushima <laughs> in the future, or you can not prioritize safety. And then we have more areas of the earth that are off limits. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, how much more of this planet do we want to like blast to smithereens before we learn these lessons? Right. And in, in terms of overall safety, though, I mean, it's still for all the years that nuclear power has been used, the number of accidents, the number of problems that we see is is it is it less than other fuel sources, mm-hmm. or is it is it more? Gosh, well, I haven't made a comprehensive study of this, but I would I would say less. I would say we've had fewer fewer nuclear accidents than than catastrophic accidents of other sorts. Um, and there's uh, there are some there are some accidents in nuclear plants that don't get as much attention as you know, obviously like Chernobyl and Three Mile Island and Fukushima um, because they were near misses. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was um, there was one plant in the United States, uh, gosh, I think this was in the 80s, um, where they found um, that it had come, that had been very close to a, a breach in the pressure vessel and no one had noticed. They, um, they eventually found that there was this, uh, uh, basically a hole that, that was eroding in the top of the pressure vessel um, because of uh, a, a sort of mixture of, of acidy liquids. Um, and they found it uh, finally because somebody was... Uh, moving a, I was tightening a bolt I think and the bolts like wiggled enormously like it, it like uh it just jerked in their hands and they realized it was like sliding into this hole that shouldn't exist wow. um yeah <laughs> so that and they really you know it was it came pretty close it was like you know like an, an inch inch or so of, of metal left between the you know the interior of the reactor and the exterior so uh so there are yeah there it is um there are um you know there are some near misses um, that, that I hope taught the nuclear industry a lot. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that these, you know, these, these are, you know, really excellent scientists and technologists who, who certainly, um, you know, want to build the safest reactor possible, um, want to learn from mistakes. Um, so we hope, you know, just that, that the Fukushima, Disaster has taught them some valuable lessons that can be applied to reactors, all reactors around the world. Um, and we hope that with each one of these, each one of these catastrophes, uh, we you know we learn we learn something important, and then, you know we reduce the next re- reduce the chance of the next one happening. Yeah, and it's 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 always interesting to me when you know when you build. Uh, something as complex as a nuclear reactor or, um, you know, a, a, a drilling rig, or you have all of these uh, uh, solutions put in place for risk management. And there's always, um, you know, a, a flow of if this happens, then this has, has to happen. And, and people look at all of the different places where things can go wrong and try and troubleshoot those before anything happens. And then when you see something like a Fukushima, it means that every single thing that has been put in place by you know, the human minds that have been working on the problem, that the, you know, the one probability out of a billion happened. Mm-hmm. 
you know, <laughs> and it and yeah. it and it happened in a domino sort of fashion to lead to is like this had to happen for this had to happen, this had to happen mm-hmm. for this had to happen, and that's the only way that we see the disaster happen, and it's why we don't see disasters happening every day at all of the the hundreds thousands mm-hmm. of nuclear reactors that are around the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they call it uh, defense in depth, just having you know layer after layer of protection. Um, and you know when I talked to um, I, I had talked to a former manager of the Fukushima Daiichi plant, uh, a, a wonderful man who had um, who had just watched, you know, like the rest of the Japanese public in horror as uh, events unfolded. Um, and he said that um, this the scale of the tsunami was beyond his imagination. Those were the mm-hmm. words he he used. And I heard them from other people too. People just said it was unimaginable that a forty foot wave could could hit this plant, um, and no one. And so that's a failure. We had failed to imagine the real worst case scenario. We had, right. people thought the worst case was, you know, a, a ten foot tsunami, or sorry, a ten uh, ten meter tsunami. Uh, no, sorry, I'm getting my I'm getting my meters and feet mixed up. It was a, it was a they were hit by a, a, a fourteen meter tsunami, which is about forty feet. Yeah, and yeah, and they they planned for maybe yeah maybe about a ten foot ten foot tsunami as the worst case scenario. So you um, always have to come up with an even worse, worst case scenario. <laughs> this is the lesson that we learn here. Um, we're coming to the, the end of the show here. And I just would love to get, you know, you've been working on this. You've been covering this story for, for a year. Um, what do you think about nuclear power? And, um, and what, what do you think your opinion um, mm-hmm. uh, about nuclear going forward? Uh, so, yeah, my personal opinion... Uh, I think it is uh, probably a necessary uh, bridge for for humans at mm-hmm. this point on the planet. Um, you know, I, I I take global warming very seriously. I take um, uh, you know carbon uh, carbon emissions very seriously, and uh, I don't I don't see how we can get quickly uh, we can scale up renewable energies like solar and wind and geothermal and everything else. I don't, don't see how we can scale those up quickly enough to solve our climate change problem in the short term. Um, so it seems to me that, that nuclear is you know, necessary to, uh, to keep us uh, from totally, totally ruining the planet <laughs> at this point in time. Uh, <laughs> I think, yeah, ideally it would be uh, nice to wean ourselves off of it eventually, um, but it seems to me like that might have to happen in the year, you know, two thousand one hundred, something right. like that. Yeah, there's always the what I'd love to happen in an ideal world, and then well, we don't really live in an ideal world, do we? <laughs> Unfortunately, um, Eliza, thank you very much for joining me on the show today. This has just been been great to talk with you about um about the work that you've done reporting on it and get the kind of personal um personal stories that didn't make it into the the articles Mm -hmm. that you've written um that you and your team have written and um for everyone out there if you are interested in looking into ieee spectrums coverage ieee spectrums coverage um it is available at spectrum.org IEEE.org, Fukushima and the future of the nuclear power of nuclear power is uh, one of the one of the pieces that was put together as well as a 24 hours at Fukushima. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you can dig into more deeply if this is a topic that interests you. Um, so once again, thank you very much, Eliza. This was great. Oh, thanks for having me, Kiki. I really enjoyed talking about all this. Yeah, I can tell. It's a, it's a, it's got it had. It has to have been just a fascinating uh, subject to work on for the last year. Just well, yeah. And I realized I'm going to be working on it for the rest of my life. I mean, they're, they've got 40 years of cleanup ahead of them. I'm 33. <laughs> I'm, you know, I figure, <laughs> I figure I'll be covering this story until I retire. Maybe I'll have a few years to relax after that. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe 40 years. We'll, I'll, I'll have you back on whatever show I'm doing, <laughs> doing in the future, and we'll have a 40 year re- retrospective. <laughs> Yeah, it'll probably be beamed straight into people's brains. It'll be very cool. <laughs> yeah, it'll be, who knows what technology will be, ha- we'll be doing then. That'll be amazing. Yeah. <laughs> All right, everybody. Uh, this is the end of the show. It's This has been Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. And um, next week, I don't know what we're talking about. I 
forget. I didn't write it down, and I'm having a brain, a, a slow brain moment. So it'll be something sciencey for sure. You can count on that. Until next week, however, you can follow my sciencey pursuits on all the social media that's out there. Look for me, Dr. Kiki, or uh, Google Plus. I'm Kiki Sanford. Additionally, you can go to my website, Dr. Kiki. At, uh, it's drkiki.tv. You can email me at Dr. Kiki at drkiki.tv. And if you need more sciencey goodness, there's always This Week in Science, which I broadcast live here from Twit every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. It's a, it's a jaunt into the sciencey news that's going on in the world. It's fun. It's irreverent. I love using that word, irreverent. But anyway, it's kick-ass. It's great. I will see you next week. So thank you very much for tuning into my science hour. Remember, all I ask is one hour a week. And additionally, if you don't have the hour, you can now download Science News Weekly, which is just the science news from the top of the show. And once a week, it's five, ten minutes, really quick, easy dig into science. And it's a way to get science into your world in a painless kind of way. So I do just ask an hour. I do. And remember, an hour a week, it makes your world a whole lot more interesting. Now it's time for your science meditation of the week. Ever since the first four-winged dinosaurs were discovered, people have wondered about how these things might have moved. Inquiries reached the point of people launching models of Microraptor into the air, building more detailed models and putting them in wind tunnels to look at airflow over these feathery surfaces. So what we found is a tail shape with these two little streamers coming off the end that seems much more consistent with a display or communication function than an aerodynamic one. We had seen these kinds of streamer tails and it was originally thought to be just in one species of early bird. And then we discovered it in another species and then in another species. Really, it looks like having decorations on your back end is all over dinosaurs. And, it, and even through this remarkable transition towards flight, that sexual selection and display function for the tail might be the thing that stays constant. What was striking in looking at the new specimen is that to realize perhaps the tail has had an ornamental function in Dinosauria for a very long time and actually assumed an aerodynamic function where it's linked with the forelimb in living birds, that maybe that was a very kind of late occurrence in the evolution of flight. That's right. Shake your tail feathers. 